This is the penultimate episode of the season, and we finally get some story. Unfortunately, that story is as stupid as it is shit. What we have here is what we always have in The Mandalorian. Dumb characters making stupid decisions, action scenes with poor choreography, and idiotic world building that makes no fucking sense. And to top it all off, Mando has a Jon Snow moment in this show, which is confirmation that he is no longer the main character, and is only there to simp for Bo-Katan, who by the way demonstrates multiple times in this episode as to why she is unfit to be the leader of anything. Now I see a lot of people saying this episode is good for two reasons. The first is that this episode has a lot more action scenes in it, and secondly, they are comparing it to the last episode, which was an absolute disgrace. But comparing cat shit to dog shit doesn't make it any better, as they are both still shit at the end of the day. Now with that said, I'm going to break down the plot. Episode 7 of the Bo-Katan show starts off in the Blade Runner universe, and we see the female spy meet up with a probe droid. Oh, I remember. Wow, the New Republic sure is lenient with ex-Imperial officers, letting them freely roam around the city whenever they want, especially the ones involved in the death of a colleague. She gives information to Gus about the Mandalorians wanting to retake Mandalore. After learning this, he walks through a hallway with the same laser walls that were in The Phantom Menace. Oh, I remember. We also get to see new types of stormtroopers enhanced with Beskar armor and carrying around jetpacks. But despite all these upgrades, my guess is that they will be just as fucking useless as every other stormtrooper. You can take that to the damn bank! Gus walks into a meeting room and we can see some sort of Imperial Council. Now this scene is here to try to justify the piece of shit sequel trilogy, and is a large part as to why every Star Wars show Disney shits out will always be terrible. And that is because Disney will never erase those skid marks, so every decision they make from now on ultimately leads back to dog shit. It's like they are following a treasure map, except the X on the map isn't treasure at all. No, it's a mass grave. Anyway, it turns out that they aren't a bunch of scattered warlords, but a full military in hiding. They must have a small army, because to conquer a galaxy, you need a colossal force to do so, and countless worlds to base and supply your troops and ships. Unless they pull the same shit that was in The Rise of Skywalker, where Palpatine summons the largest navy ever out of thin fucking air, which is what they are definitely going to do here. Also, if Gus was a part of such a large group, then where were his reinforcements when his ship was taken over by five people? My guess is that the writers have only just retconned this in, because, and this may shock you, they never plan anything ahead. What? No! We also have a name drop of Admiral Hux's dad. Who the fuck cares? And he is working on Project Necromancer. Wow, the naming conventions in this show are just so subtle, because I just cannot figure out for the life of me what that code name could possibly mean. Somehow Palpatine returned. We are also introduced to Captain Pelion from the Thrawn trilogy, and although he does nothing now, I guarantee Dave Filoni is going to rape him as a character in the future. Anyway, there is a lot of back and forth about fuck all, until Gus says that the Mandalorians could pose a threat. All 80 of them. We already received your request. Three Praetorian Guards. Now are Praetorians the personal guards of the Emperor? How does Hux have command over them? I don't know. The Council agrees to give Gus reinforcements because the giant shadow army is terrified of this tiny group of people who argue about wearing helmets all day. We cut to Navarro and Bo-Katan's fleet arrives above the city. That's a light cruiser. That ship, according to Wikipedia, usually has a crew of 750 men, and yet when they land, there is not even a tenth of that number. So how does this tiny group possibly have the manpower to pilot all of those ships? It's not possible. They arrive at the camp, and we can see the helmet wearers stand off against the non-helmet wearers. This is stopped when the blacksmith bangs his stupid tools together. Let us prepare a feast for our guests. And just how exactly the ones who wear helmets have to walk miles away from everyone just to eat. Are you a complete retard? Apollo Creed arrives and tells Mando that they have repurposed the IG-88 droids to be used as a mech suit for Baby Yoda. I know they call it IG-12, but the actual name is IG-88, no matter how much they repurpose shit. Baby Yoda takes the mech suit out for a walk, and the very first thing he does is steal from a store. You evil fuck! 
Now, baby Yoda's intelligence level doesn't make any sense, because on one hand, he is smart enough to operate a mech suit, and yet he doesn't seem to understand that stealing is wrong. No. Yes. Hey, Google, no. Give it no. I take that back. This little shit knows exactly what he's doing and doesn't give a fuck. He is a grown man pretending to be a baby. This sick freak is an adult with a baby fetish. If his behaviour is not corrected soon, then he is only going to get worse and will eventually turn into a complete cunt if Mando doesn't start hitting him soon. Later that night, Bo-Katan says that they are going to Mandalore and once they reach orbit, We send down a small recon party. We'll scout the surface, find out what remains of the Great Forge. So because of science bullshit, they are unable to scan the planet from above the atmosphere. So their plan is to send a small group of people to land in the middle of nowhere and wander around the entire planet on foot until they come across the Great Forge. That's fucking stupid. Now, it's obvious to anyone who isn't a complete retard that this plan is beyond stupid, as walking across the entire planet looking for an underground forge would take forever. Why do they not send one or just several ships down below the atmosphere to zoom around Mandalore a few times and scan the planet? You could have a detailed map of the entire planet within a few hours. Well, the group just stumbles off into a random direction in the vain hope of finding the forge, but luckily for them, them, they almost immediately bump into another group of Mandalorians who are sailing on a land boat, no less. What the fuck am I watching? Bo Katan once again has a conversation from over a mile away, and luckily for her, these Mandalorians haven't turned into marauders or cannibals. Despite being isolated on a dead world for almost a decade, what's even more convenient is that they offer them a ride to the Great Forge, the one place they are looking for. Wow, that's really lazy. On the way, the group has yet another chat about their feelings. Mandalore has always been too powerful for any enemy to defeat. Wrong! That's wrong! That's not true. You lost against the Jedi, then the Empire, and now you are losing to giant lizards. In fact, you often lose more than you win. So after dinner, Manda walks up to Bo-Katan and sims for her. Your song is not yet written. I will serve you until it is. You are my queen. He is without a doubt no longer the main character of his own TV show. It's almost like a divorce where she took everything he owns. Before heading out, the blacksmith decides to take the wounded back to the ship, as Bo-Katan doesn't make a single decision in this show, despite being the leader. On the way to the forge, a fight breaks out between Axe Body Spray and the Large Mandalorian over a game of chess because these supposed Spartans, these disciplined warriors, have the same emotional control as a Karen on TikTok. Bo-Katan shows us her great leadership skills by letting them attack each other and not stepping in and showing her authority. Should I step in? Neither side can step in. You're in charge of both groups. You're an idiot if you let one of them die, as this won't be the end of it. Blood feuds exist for a reason. The fight eventually does get stopped, but in the most embarrassing way possible. No. 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 Ah. The fact that Bo-Katan didn't step in establishes that she is a weak leader and Baby Yoda is clearly capable of understanding much more than he pretends to. Time passes and the group spots yet another dinosaur. Fuck me, how many dinosaurs has this group ran into this season? They must be a reptile magnet. What's even worse is that they see this giant monster from miles away, but they only decide to turn away from it at the very last second as it destroys the ship. They then take cover in a nearby cave, and what do you know, they stumble across the very thing they were looking for. Christ, who wrote this? They are then attacked by jet troopers wearing Beskar armor. Now, Beskar armor is literal plot armor, because as we can see many times in this fight scene, it will get hit and have zero effect, but when the plot needs it to, suddenly it's no more effective than regular Stormtrooper armor. If the writing was consistent and Beskar armor acted the way it was supposed to, then everyone here would not be able to kill each other. Man, those Derringer bullets are weak! Also, the Mandalorians are surprised by the fact that the Empire is on Mandalore. So let me get this straight. This show is trying to tell us that these Mandalorians they bumped into 
that were trapped on the planet for nearly 10 years never saw any Empire activity at all, no TIE fighters flying past, or the construction of an enormous Imperial base going on. These blind fucks saw nothing at all. You're absolutely fucking useless. Axe Body Spray decides to go for help, and the big Mandalorian just starts killing everyone, even though they're wearing blaster-proof armor. So how exactly is Axe going to help them? They can't communicate off-world, this show has established that jetpacks have a limited range before they run out of fuel, so there is no way for him to leave the atmosphere and get out a message. Anyway, we have some more terrible fight scenes. What the hell was that? The jet troopers then flee and the Mandalorians give chase, but then all of the Mandalorians walk into a trap. More jet troopers appear and very easily kill all the other Mandalorians before they go on to capture Mando. Bo-Katan is just watching this happen when she could very easily use her Darksaber to cut through the door, but being the shit leader she is, she just forgets that she has it. Gus shows up in his new costume and gives us yet another boring fucking monologue until he decides to knock kill Mando. Why? Why he doesn't kill Mando, the man who has already beaten him twice before, is beyond me. Well, you're gonna put him in a cell with one inept guard and they'll escape. God, you do this every time! Gus then somehow has a conversation with Bo-Katan through a soundproof blast door, and he says something I agree with. I believe this is the part where you return the dark saber to its rightful owner. Yes, give it back to Mando, as you are clearly too stupid to use it. So after being reminded that she has the Darksaber, she finally uses it to escape. The big Mandalorian and terrible father who decided to wait a whole day before saving his son tells everybody, Go! There are too many! No there isn't, as he kills all of them by himself pretty easily. These people are such a non-threat that he barely reacts to them shooting him the entire scene. Beskar armor is so broken that punching it is somehow more effective than shooting it a hundred times with supercharged plasma. Well, that's just silly. Silly, yes. Idiotic, yes. The action scenes in this show are so poorly executed and terribly thought out because the showrunners clearly don't give a fuck. I mean, look at this scene. He throws jet troopers off the ledge and they just forget that they have jetpacks. Why is everyone so fucking stupid? So after killing all of these useless jet troopers, three Praetorian guards just show up out of fucking nowhere. They just come from off screen. Now the big Mandalorian has two options. A, he could just fly away on his jetpack as there is a massive hole above him. Or B, if he wanted to fight, he could just pick up one of the many blasters found on the floor and then fly up high, giving himself a range advantage. No, this absolute moron decides to pull out a tiny shaky knife and run right at them. You are stupid. Now his Beskar armor, which was indestructible less than a minute ago, is now about as useful as a used condom. He ends up getting killed pretty easily and that's the end of the episode. Wow, that's really, really boring. So that was a dog shit episode, and my guess for the finale is that Gus is going to give us yet another shit monologue before he gets beaten for the third time in a row. Getting stuck in a revolving door is much more of a threat than this wanker is, and yet we have been stuck with him for three seasons now. He's not a credible villain, he's a giant waste of time. Now after this show ends, in August we have the Ahsoka show, where Dave Filoni and Jon Favreau bastardise the Thrawn trilogy. Then after that piece of shit show comes out, we then have a Ray Palpatine movie to look forward to. Please, make it stop. Star Wars is a brain dead patient that Disney refuses to let die, until it can suck the very last ounce of marrow from the bones of this IP. Anyway, that was episode 7 of the Bo-Katan show. Now I'm off to do something much more productive. I gotta try and take a shit.